Well, I know many of you, but I don't know all of you. And so I know that uh, a number of you have been believers in the Lord Jesus for a very long time. And uh, some of you perhaps have only just begun the Christian life and some may not even have begun it yet. But a question that comes up from time to time, sometimes other people ask us, sometimes we ask ourselves, uh, can I keep going? Will I be able to keep going as a Christian? Will I be able to go all the way through the rest of my life and keep on right to the end? And that's a question that might occur to us at any time in our Christian lives if we're Christians. But it might occur to you before you become a Christian. You say, well, I don't know whether I can keep this up. I don't know whether I'll be able to, to do it. Well, the wonderful thing is that uh, God gives us grace. And he gives us grace to keep going. But he also gives us certain things to help us in our Christian life. He doesn't leave us alone. He's given us things. He's given things to every every Christian to keep us going. I like to say when I'm talking to the children that it's given us five things. I like to summarize them in terms of five things because we've got five fingers. And so the first thing, the thumb, I like that because it's the thickest one, the, the biggest one. He's given us his word. God has given us the Bible. Second thing he's given us is prayer. I like that finger too because it points upwards and prayer goes upwards, doesn't it? third thing God's given us, quite tall, the church. God's given us a church. Amazing that God has given us other people. So we're not on our own. We can meet with others. We can help one another. We can encourage one another. God has given us a church so that we can help one another. And lots of things within the church as well. He's given us two other things as well that we also call ordinances. He's given us baptism and he's given us the communion. We're going to have communion tonight. And all five of these things God has given us in order to help us and keep us going. They are things through which he communicates to us his grace. It's, those are the ways that God gives us his grace. And so we need to use all of those things well. We need to use every one of those things well. This morning I want to talk to you about the word of God. I want to talk to you about the Bible, the first of those things. And I want to ask you some questions before we start. You might have heard thousands of sermons. If you come to church twice every Sunday for your whole life and you live over 70, 80 years, you're going to hear about 6,000, 7,000 sermons, I reckon. You might have heard a lot. You might have only heard one or two sermons. It may be the first time you're in church, I don't know. But let me ask you with some questions. Start with some questions. What do you expect to get out of the sermon today. What do you want the sermon to do in your life today? And by that, I mean, what do you want God to do through the sermon in your life today? Because that's important, isn't it? The sermon itself is not the important thing. It's what God can do through it. Another question, what do you think you need to do in order for God to work in your life through his word today. And do you want God to work in your life and then to work through you so that you bless others? I think they're important questions. And they're questions we ought to ask, because sometimes we get very familiar with coming to church and listening to sermons, don't we? But in the parable of the sower, the Lord Jesus identifies four types of hearer, four types of hearer. If we'd read on a little bit, we would have read this verse where Jesus says in um, verse 18 of Luke 8, take care then how you hear. Take care then how you hear. We all know it's really important what we hear. What you listen to is very, very important in life, isn't it? It's really important that you listen to the right things because you need to know that you're listening to the things that are true. And there's so many things that are being told us every day. You've got to have some sort of a filter to say, well, is that true? Isn't that true? Do I need to be listening to this? Don't I need to be listening to this? Um, if someone's telling us something, do we really need to hear that? Do we really need to know that? 
So we need to be careful what we hear. And the Bible certainly tells us we need to be careful what we hear. But Jesus also says, be careful how you hear. And the parable of the sower is all about how we hear, how we hear God's word. And, and Jesus says that God's word is like a seed. Now, a seed is one of the most amazing things in the whole world, if you think about it. It's really tiny. It looks as if it's dead. And yet, if you put it in the right place, in the right conditions, it will germinate, it will sprout, it will grow, and it will become something far, far, far bigger than it originally was. And it will bring fruit. It has huge potential, just one seed but it's got to land in the right place hasn't it? it's it got to land in the right soil and that's what Jesus's parable of the sower is all about it's about how the word of God is landing and particularly where it's landing and what our hearts are like as as it lands the word of God is only going to be effective in our lives when it's received and heard in the right way Jesus is uh, the master storyteller, isn't he? All the best stories and all the best storytellers follow the same pattern that Jesus, uh, Jesus followed here in what is his, his most famous and probably his most important parable, the parable of the sower. First of all, Jesus captures our imagination. He said the farmer went out to sow the seed. Oh, wow, what's going to happen next? And he wants us to, to think about this. Oh, the farmer's going out. And he's sowing his seed. Now, we need to remember that uh, when he sowed his seed in Jesus' day, the farmer would have had his seed in a big bag. And he would have put his hand in and he would have got a whole load of seed and he'd have thrown it here, there, everywhere. He would have broadcast. That's the, that's the origin of the word broadcasting. Just throwing it everywhere, casting the seed out. That's how he would have sown the seed. And, and as Jesus goes through his story, we see this seed landing in different places. The most important thing about the parable is not the farmer. He's not the most important. The most important thing is the seed, because the seed is the word of God, as Jesus explains. And the most important thing about that seed is where it's going to land. And there are four different places where this seed lands. The very first place it lands is the path. And the path, well... Why is there a path? Well, there's a path because the sower, the farmer has to walk along it. And maybe, maybe that path has become hardened because the farmer has walked along it so often. Maybe we hear the word of God so often, but it actually hardens our hearts. We need to be careful of that, don't we? If that's the case, we need to make sure that that hard ground is broken up and plowed up. We need to ask God to break our hearts really, soften our hearts so that the word of God can really land in good soil because it's not going to do anything if it lands on, the, on the, hard, the hard path. So that's no good. We don't want hard hearts. Our hearts need to be receptive to God's word. And then the second, the second lot of seed, it, it lands on rocky ground. We need to understand this not in terms of, you know, in your garden you might dig up a few stones here and there. Uh, it's not that. This is where underneath the, the soil you get, a, you get a, a substratum of rock. So there's a, there's a layer of soil, but you go, go down just a little way and you hit rock then. And there's a whole lot of, lot of rock there, uh, a big mass of rock really. And, of course, the problem with that is that the, the roots will go down, but only a little way. And that means that the seed will, will put all its energy to sprouting up, and you get a lovely plant, but it's got no roots. So it's unstable. Uh, and not only is it unstable, but it can't draw all of the goodness out of the soil. And what happens then is that the, it just withers after a while. It looks good to start with, but <laughs> some people are like that, aren't they? They hear, they hear the the message, they hear the word of God and they're so thrilled with it. Wow, this is the best thing I've ever heard. This is wonderful. I'm going to devote my whole life to Jesus Christ. And they start coming to church and it all looks really good. But then after a while they drop off and you don't see them. What's going on? What's going on is that it's all above ground and there's nothing really going deeply into their hearts, is there? They've got the joy of salvation but they haven't got the reality of salvation because they've never really repented. 
They've never really come to terms with their own need of a saviour and sin. The roots haven't gone down and they're not putting those roots down into Christ and drawing all that they can from him. So that's no good. The word of God is not going to be effective in someone's heart like that, where there really is still that hard heart, even though it's covered over by a little bit of, of, of soil. The third lot of seed falls amongst the the weeds and the thorns and the thistles, and they grow up with it. Now, this is a problem, isn't it? Because there's so many other things in our lives. And unfortunately, if we allow all those other things, they might be worries. They might be troubles, difficulties, problems that we're having to face. And they become so big in our lives that they stop us coming to church. They stop us hearing the word of God. They stop us having our time with God's word because those worries and those troubles are so great that we just can't cope with it. And church goes, the Bible goes, preaching goes, the worries of life. It can also be the pleasures of life. It can also be a desire to get rich uh, or even just to, to have enough money. And we say, well, I can't really spend any time with God's people. I can't really listen to the word of God. I can't come to church today because I'm just so busy. Or I've got to go here. I've got to go there. And, and unfortunately, the word of God is not going to be effective, mainly because these other things are crowding out the word of God. But Jesus leaves the best to the end, doesn't he? He, he keeps us listening. He keeps us listening. And then he says, ah, but what about the good soil? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, mainly, is a the good soil, the good heart, the, how the word of God can truly be profitable in our lives. Because this is what I, what I want, and this is what God wants in each of us. He would have his word be effective in us. So what does he say? Well, this is the verse. Um, it's verse 15. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast, in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. So the first thing that Jesus says is that the, the, the heart that truly receives the word effectively is a heart that is two things. He says it's a heart that is honest and a heart that is good. A heart that is honest and good. Two interesting words because if someone said to you have you got a good heart we'd say well what do you mean by that we have good-hearted people don't we and what we mean by that often is that they're people who are open-hearted who are kind in that sense they're they're good-hearted but that's not what Jesus means by a good heart there are different words that are used that all mean good really and both of these words, honest and good, they both actually mean good, but good in different ways. So first of all, Jesus is saying that your heart needs to be a heart that's been prepared by God. That's what he means by good. In the same way that the farmer goes along and the ground has been prepared. The ground has been ploughed, it's been weeded, the rocks have been removed, it's, it's been prepared, it is, it is soil, it is ground that is right ready to receive God's word because it's been prepared by someone else. And so your heart and my heart are not good by nature. In fact, they're quite the opposite. One of the tough things that the Bible tells us that we need to take on board if we're ever going to come to Jesus, if we're ever going to have our sins forgiven, one of the things we've got to come to terms with is that we're not good. It's one of the things that I remember myself when I was a, quite a young boy having to face this because I thought I was good. I really did think I was a good boy. My parents were Christians. We went to church every single Sunday I tried to do what was good and right. I wasn't a bad person. I'd never done anything particularly bad. I was certainly as good as anybody else, if not better than most, is what I thought. And then as I grew up and as I listened to the word of God, 
I listened to the preaching. I listened to my Sunday school teachers. I heard them say that the Bible said that my heart was deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And I found that hard. And you might find that hard as well because you think, I'm not a bad person. But then you have to assess yourself on the basis of what God says. And God says that you have to be perfect. You have to be as good as his son, Jesus Christ. That's the standard. And none of us, I don't think, would even claim to come near to the goodness of Jesus Christ. We're not. And then you begin to assess your life on the basis of what God says. And you say, have I ever told lies? And even as a young boy, I knew I'd told lies. Have you really always loved people in the way you should? And I had to admit, at the times when I hated my brother, I really hated him and wished that he didn't exist. Hmm. I wasn't good. My heart wasn't good. If we're going to receive the word of God, the first thing that needs to happen is that God needs to change our hearts. And that means that we have to come to him honestly in repentance and say, I am not a good person. I need my heart changed by God. The first purpose of preaching is to drive you to Jesus Christ, you see. You in your sinfulness and in your need of a saviour to drive you to Jesus Christ, to humble you and to reveal to you that the only way of you being made right with God is for you to come to God humbly and say, I need you to change my heart. I need a new life. I need to be renewed. The Bible talks about us being born again, being given a new heart, having our old heart taken away and our new heart being given. Not the physical heart, of course, but the heart of our lives, the very center of our being, our soul needs to be renewed by God. And that's what Jesus means by a good heart. It's good in essence. It's good in itself. It's been made good by God. You must be born again. And only God can do that. And we need to seek him for that if we've never done that before. But then the other word that Jesus used is honest. The NIV says noble. It's a difficult word to translate. It means good. <laughs> but it means good in the terms of uh, looking good. Not just good in its essence, but something that is beautiful, something that is perfectly formed, something that is uh, able to do what it's meant to do. Uh, a vase, uh, so shaped perfectly that it will contain the flowers and it will show them in all their true beauty. Jesus says, doesn't he, salt is good. Salt is good, and it's the same word that he uses there, uh, as long as it remains salty. Because it's good in the sense that it does what it's supposed to do. It's useful in that way. It's salty. But as soon as it loses its saltiness, it's no good anymore. And in the same way, Jesus is saying, your heart needs to be kept good. It needs to be kept in that right frame so that it, it does what it's meant to do. So, first of all, you can't change your own heart. Only God can do that. But when God does that, it's our responsibility as Christians to make sure that our heart is kept fit for purpose, so to speak. You know, our cars, we, we keep them fit for purpose. We make sure, or a bike, if you're a young person, you've got a bike, you, you make sure you haven't got any flat tires, don't you? You make sure that everything's working, that the chain's not going to get all rusted up. Uh, you make sure that it's fit for purpose, so when you jump on your bike, you can go away like that. And in the same way, our hearts need to be kept, kept good. And when we've received a new heart from God, it's our responsibility to keep it pure, to keep it open to the Lord, keep it sensitive to the Spirit. We mustn't allow other things to come in and crowd into that heart. We need to keep it fit for purpose. It's so easy for, the Bible talks about a root of bitterness. Bitterness is something that can really damage the Christian heart, can't it? And if we feel ourselves becoming hardened in heart, we need to come to God in repentance and Get it ploughed up again. And we need to make sure that we're kept right. God has given us his word, you see, the seed. But we have a responsibility to make sure our hearts are kept right every time we hear this word. We need to come to church with prepared hearts. Sometimes it's busy, isn't it? But nonetheless, we need to take that little bit of time to say, Lord, I want a right heart. Speak to me today. Even a very simple prayer as you come to church. Lord, speak to me today. May there be something today 
that you want to say to me and may I be ready to hear that and then to take that away. We need to pray that sort of prayer, don't we? So your heart must be prepared by God and by you. That's the first thing. Second thing is this from this verse. You must work hard when you hear the word of God. You must work hard when you hear the word of God. We all, we all think that the preacher works hard. Well, actually, preachers work hard during the week. It's the easy bit when you get here. It's the hard work has to be done in the week. But you have to do the hard work when you arrive. And you need to come with a prepared heart, and then you need to listen in the right way. So what does, what does the Lord Jesus say? Well, you, you might know that this parable of the sower comes in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's one of those parables that comes three times, so it must be important, mustn't it? But each one of the gospel writers adds something else to our understanding of what it means to have a good heart and what it means to receive the word of God. So, first of all, we need to, well, I'll tell you all four, okay, that it might help you to know where we're going. We need to hear, we need to understand, we need to accept, and we need to retain the word of God. Those are the four things that the gospel writers tell us. Hear, understand, accept, and retain the word of God. So all, f all three, did I say four? All three of the gospel workers tell us that we have to hear the word of God. And, uh, and um, Luke tells us that. As for that, in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hearing the word. The Lord Jesus primarily wants us to hear the word of God and not to read it. Now, you might find that a little bit strange. Of course we're to read the Bible. No doubt about that. But don't forget that everybody possessing a Bible is a very recent thing. In fact, for centuries, people didn't own their own Bible. And also, there have been many, many people and many different people groups in the world who can't read anyway. So the primary way that God has designed for us to receive his word is by hearing it. He wants us to hear it. Even the New Testament letters were designed to be read. You know, the church will be met together on a, on a Sunday and uh, whoever was leading the, the meeting would say, we've had a letter from Paul and I'm going to read it to you. And they would read the whole letter. They're letters. They'd be read in one go. They might then go back and read bits of it like we do and think about it more closely, but they were designed to be read to everybody. It was one letter, it was received by the church, and then it was read and it was heard because God will have us hear the word of God. We're privileged in our generation to be able to read and also to have a Bible. Some of us have many Bibles in our homes, don't we? But don't neglect the fact that God's primary way of you receiving his word is by hearing it hearing it. So you need to be here, don't you, to hear God's word. Secondly, we need to understand it. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 23, Matthew says that Jesus said we must understand the word of God. I'm sure Jesus used all of these words and the three gospel writers are simply uh, reporting different aspects of what Jesus said. Um, so we're to understand the word of God. We need to understand the words we need to be able to put two and two together and make four. We need to make sense of what's being said. And some of that, a lot of that, is responsibility of the preacher. Jesus was a master preacher, wasn't he? And he always made himself crystal clear to those who wanted to understand. But we must all strive to understand what is being said. And if we don't understand it, we need to ask. You know, a preacher's here to be questioned afterwards, not perhaps during the sermon. Although when I grew up, that's what we did. We were meeting in our front room and the preacher was just really standing about over there by that wall. And if we didn't understand anything, we'd put our hand up and ask a question. Um, and, and that was great. I, I thought that was how church worked. But we can't do that in a big group. So ask if you don't understand, but strive to understand the word of God. Thirdly, we need to accept it. Mark tells us in Mark 4 verse 20 that we must receive it we must ac admit that it is true and we must admit that it's got a claim on our lives. We've got to accept it. You see, it's possible to hear God's word and to understand it and still say, I don't accept that. I don't agree with that. But Jesus says, if we're really going to benefit from God's word, we need to accept it. We need to take it in. We need to welcome it. 
sometimes that word that Mark used for accept is used for welcome. That's rather nice, isn't it? To welcome the word of God, to embrace it and to take it into ourselves. And then fourthly, as well as hearing, understanding and accepting, we need to retain the word of God. Uh, that's, uh, that is what uh, Luke says here in verse 15 of Luke 8. We must hold it fast. That's a great word, isn't it? Hold it fast. Retain it. Possess it. Hold it fast. Don't let, just let it pass through your mind and then forget all about it. Hold on to it. Hold on to the word of God. How can you do that? Well, you've got to find your own way, really, haven't you? Some, some uh, Christians take notes of sermons, and some people find that very helpful. Uh, but it's good to think about. Basically, you've got to think about what you hear. Go over it in your mind, maybe over your Sunday lunch, uh, when you get home, perhaps, from church in the evening, during the week. Try to bring to mind the main points. Ask the Lord to help you to remember the main message that you, you needed to hear. One of our elderly men is with the Lord now, but he was an, an elder in our church and he's well into his 90s. But after every sermon, he would come and say, right, now let me get this right. These were your three points today, normally three points. These were your three points today. Am I right? Did I get that right? And then somebody else would say, well, I, I got the first two. I think, what, what was the third one? Just trying to retain it, trying to think through it. Talk about the sermon. Talk about what you've read in your Bible. Talk about what the Lord has shown you in his word. Deuteronomy 6 says that these are things we should talk about with our family, with our children, when we rise up, when we lie down, when we're walking along the street. Talk about the word of God. That's one way that we retain it, isn't it? And pray, pray that God would help you to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest what you're reading from God's word. So first thing then, um, you need to have a heart prepared. Prepared by God, but also prepared by you then. You must work hard when you hear the word of God. But then third and finally and briefly, you'll be fruitful. You will be fruitful in your Christian life if you do these things. What does uh, Jesus look for in his hearers? That's an interesting question, isn't it? If you think about this parable, what was it that Jesus was looking for in his hearers? Was he looking for great understanding? I don't think so. Was he looking for the ability to repeat the lessons that he has taught them? I don't think so. Was he looking for books to be written and great debates to be held, uh, held on the precise meanings of all of his words? I don't think so. He was looking for fruit. That's what he's looking for. And uh, other parables also emphasize this. The fact that above everything else, God looks for fruit in your life and in my life and in our churches. He's looking for fruit fruit. What is that fruit? Well, primarily, of course, it's the fruit of a changed life. It's a fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's also the fruit of good works, which will be different for all of us, because we all have our different uh, spheres of life, and, and the word of God should affect the way that you live tomorrow morning. The word of God should affect the, the way that you have a conversation with your next door neighbor. The word of God should affect the way that you do your job. The word of God should affect every part of your life. And all that is fruit. And it's all going to be different depending on who we are. And there'll be different levels of fruit as well. That's why some of the parables say some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. It's to depending upon our circumstances and our opportunities, isn't it? Fruit of praise and the fruit of thanksgiving. The fruit of perseverance, keeping going. Um, Luke says at the end of his verse, patience, keeping going, perseverance. The fruit of lives that point to Jesus. And uh, not only in things that we do, but I always say this because of our congregation back at home, but also all of our congregations, there comes a point in life where you can't do the things that you used to do. Even I'm starting to realize that. There comes a point where you can't do what you used to do. And it can be very frustrating because you think, I'm not being fruitful. I'm not doing what I want to do. I could do so much more when I was younger, when I was fitter. I can't do it anymore. Well, the wonderful thing about fruit is this. It's not just about what we do. It's also about how we bear the difficulties of life. And people will watch us and they will see how you put up with the things that are thrown at you. 
I do love a verse of a hymn. Uh, it's Jesus, I, my cross have taken. This verse has been taken out of our new Christian hymns. I don't think it should have been, but there we are. Listen to this. Take uh, the, 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 the hymn begins, Jesus, I, my cross have taken. But this is the verse. Take my soul, thy full salvation. Rise or sin and fear and care. Joy to find in every station, that is every situation in life, joy to find in every station, something still to do or bear. Lord, give me something that I can do today. Lord, give me something that I can bear today for your glory. The word of God, and especially the preaching of the word of God, is the first and the greatest means that God has given us to help us in our Christian life, to keep us going right to the end. So use it well. If you want to grow, if you want to be fruitful, don't neglect it. If you neglect the word of God and the hearing of the word of God, your soul will wither and others will not benefit from your Christian life. But if you receive the word of God with great joy and if you work at it, then you will find that you will be fruitful in your life for the glory and for the honour of Jesus Christ.